through visual narratives, right? How uh, these main movements are movements of er early modernism were trying to uh, give a sense of the national unity for these countries uh, by, you know, producing art and making uh, visual uh, pieces. <coughs> But I always start this course with a provocation, right? Does Latin America even exist? Right? What we are, we are talking about when we use uh, the term Latin America, and I'll just admit some, someone who's coming. Is it really possible, right, to define Latin American art or Latin America? And although I always use the term and the category, I always also try to challenge the very term because um, it is really a lumping, right? A category that lumps everything together and kind of an umbrella term um, that actually sometimes doesn't mean anything, right? It, it means like a, a very abstract idea of what these cultures and what these countries are. So is it possible to define it? Is it possible to, uh, to really consider that category as useful when we're talking about history and when you're talking about art? So I, I use uh, an author whose uh, name is Thomas Holloway and, and Holloway argues that it's difficult to locate Latin America, right? Locate both geographically and historically. Uh, so if we start looking at how the geography is organized, we already see that, um, you know, we have all this territory here, which is called, can you see my cursor, my mouse cursor? Here? Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> so we have uh, North America, but then we start all this area here, it's kind of considered Latin America. Right, and but it's huge, right? How can we really uh, use this this term then uh, to um, to create a, a meaningful uh, category? So, if we start thinking about geography, we divide America into continents, North and South America, right? And then subregions. There are Central America and the Caribbean. Right. And in this course, I'm not going to be covering everything, right? It's impossible really to cover everything. Even if I had a course of like two years, right? It would be impossible to cover everything. Uh, and if you talk about history, then we, we try to create a, a sense of, of cohesiveness when we think about the shared history of colonialism, right? Because it's also very, uh, very different types of colonization, but there's a, this uh, notion that they all struggling, right, with colonialism. All these countries were struggling with colonialism. And, but, so geographically, sometimes even you think of Guianas and Belize there, uh, some people do not consider them effectively as part of Latin America because they were not occupied by Spain, Spain and Portugal, for example. Uh, and they were not, um, not colonies of these two main uh, countries. Uh, so it's already like, you know, a contested, uh, contested category, even if you think about history or geography. So the first time we, there's notice of using the term Latin America goes far as back as 1850s. And it was used to create this uh, linguistic and, and religious differentiation between the Latin peoples of the Americas and the Anglo-Saxon peoples, right? And some scholars say that the, that the term first appeared in the writings of Michel Chavalier, who traveled through, throughout Mexico and the US in the late 1830s. Um, so, and Chevalier was part of this movement called Pan-Latinism that was wanted to bring together the neo-Latin language communities uh, to unite kind of a, in a, gre a great Latin family. But as you can see, and something that uh, Thomas Holloway in other scholars say is that Latin America, the name Latin America comes from outside, right? It's not a name 
uh, that was coming from the people of Latin America, really. It was coming from outside and in a category that was kind of imposed into these people. It was not an indigenous term. It was not uh, uh, something that was actually used, right, by these people. And that's really about, um, um, it, you know, having this idea of naming as a violence, right? Naming as a, as a type of epistemic violence that kind of forces a certain terminology into cultures and peoples, right? So I always use this quote to, to explain how, you know, it, within this idea of naming, like the, the, this region, Latin America, you erase a lot of diversity, right? You, you end up erasing a plurality and diversity. So this is what Catherine Walsh says about this uh, type of violence, right? The European baptizing of the continent drastically modified the history, the plurality, the social, cultural, economic, spiritual, territorial, and existential foundation of these lands, making it by naming it a singular unity unit seen and defined from the European gaze, a naming that intended to annihilate all that existed before. So it's really about, um, you know, using the category, but then uh, it replaces the rest, right? It replaces the specificities of each culture and each, um, and each peoples that live in this region. And of course, many Latin Americans, and, and I noticed that one of you actually used the, the term America for the entire, right, entire, uh, continent, but many light Latin Americans say that um, hemisphere say that America is not the U.S. Right? America is really the South and the now the and and, uh, and the North America. And when I was born in uh, and I lived in Brazil, we never talked about America as only the U.S. Right? We always thought of, of ourselves as Americans in a way. So that's kind of a funny thing that I always use in my course to mention uh, that we, it, when I moved to the US, everybody was talking ab about America and I was like, oh yeah, everybody is American in a sense, right? We all like living in this uh, region that it was uh, named after uh, Americo Vespucci uh, when uh, during uh, colonial times. Uh, so this is a, an artwork that is uh, by a Chilean artist uh, from the 80s, and he, he projected this image here, this is not America, to uh, the Times Square in the 80s. And it was kind of like Times Square at the time, uh, uh, I'm sure you, you remember, I was... <laughs> I was a baby there, but uh, it was only that I think that like the big screen, right? But not not a lot of screens like it it is today now with all these overwhelming screens. So this was really kind of like um, a big message on in the eighties in in New York City, in Times Square, and it was kind of like making a joke with that idea of naming, right? That we we have uh, uh, especially not only with Latin America, but with, with the territories of the US as well. So it's really just to, to you know, to push um, this idea further, right? That we, we still use the category, we still need the name, but it's really, we have to always try to contest it and, and see what's behind the, that uh, ideology, right? What's behind uh, uh, naming such a large territory uh, under one, one category. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to talk about Mexican muralism as one of the main movements in, uh, in our history from Latin America that define what uh, modern art is, right? And um, so I have some key terms, I don't know if you, if you need them, but I really think it's, uh, usually it's how I structure the class, so the lectures, so I have the first, the very first are gonna appear in the beginning of, of this section. So social realism, Mexican muralism, the cosmic race, mestizaje or racial miscegenation, 
and the anthropophagic movement. So one of the main questions of modern art in Latin America is uh, how to talk about a modernism, uh, modernity, all the discourses that were coming from Europe and the US and, and still think about societies that were devastated by colonial invasion, right? And societies that had a very, um, um, a deep history embedded and rooted in coloniality. So uh, all these generations, these inter, uh, intellectual classes that were trying to come up with art movements and be, uh, gathering uh, around the idea of modern art, they were thinking about colonialism. They were thinking about the, the history of their countries and, and the implication into colonial uh, invasion of their territories. And so this is kind of like a, an, um, uh, a shared you know, uh, notion uh, behind these movements that I'm gonna talk to about today. And I'm gonna skip this because uh, it's more, more about you know, theories of modernity. So Latin American art movements such as the Mexican muralism and the anthropophagic movement in Brazil, they sought to represent a notion of modern nation um, by building uh, on modernization that had become prevalent since the enlightenment and throughout the 20th century. So they were trying to think about both the modernization of their countries, right? The industrialization of their countries but they also had to grapple with the history of colonial uh, uh, conquer, right, and invasion. So this is a, always a contradiction, right? Because um, colonial invasion uh, devastated the native uh, peoples, right, and the native cult cultures of these countries. But at the same time, they were uh, so this is, was a problem, a social problem. But they also, uh, these nations also wanted to talk about modernization and also wanted to, you know, um, get caught up with the US and Europe. So it was always kind of like two different, you know, combative uh, ways of thinking about a nation and how you, you become a modern nation. And in Europe, what happens is that America and Latin America, uh, they always thought about these territories as an utopia, right? Uh, um, tabula rasa, that they could come and, and start from scratch, right? So if you read the first, the letter of Christopher Columbus, uh, when he arrives in, 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 in so-called America, it's all about, you know, starting from scratch and everything is empty and beautiful that it's like all um, ready to be conquered, right? Which is, we know is not true. There were a lot of indigenous peoples there and they had their own societies, but there's always this idea of utopia, right? That you can start from scratch and coming from Europe to, to the Americas. So when you have the, the Latin Americans thinking about modernity, uh, they usually look back at Europe, like they want to, you know, look back and respond to Europe at this moment in, in early modernism. And, and you're going to see how, uh, how artists are then looking back at Europe and trying to respond to these, uh, you know, centuries of, of European thinking and influence in, in Latin America. Okay, so we can start with Mexico. So Mexican muralism, um, which is, is the movement itself, flourished right after the Mexican Revolution, so which happened in 1910. Uh, and Mexico was living a 34 years uh, dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. Uh, so this was a government that was sustaining the economic growth but it was not supporting local economies. So uh, the laborers and, laborers and the bourgeoisie were both unsatisfied with, with the dictatorship of Diaz. And then when he tried to re be reelected in 1910, uh, for, uh, there was an insurrection that was supported by Emiliano Zapata. Here you see him in this image in the south of Mexico. And then uh, Francisco Villa, 
uh, Pancho Villa in the north. So they were trying to support the insurrection against uh, Diaz. And that was a struggle of 10 years of, of insurrection. And, um, but then at, in 1920, uh, Alvaro Obregón was elected president and there was an end to, to the revolution. Um, so the revolution, when it, it ended, uh, there was a great you know, moment of modernization in Mexico and, and in especially obviously in the urban areas. But there was still a mass of peasants, right? A mass of, uh, of uh, um, rural workers who are kind of like uh, separated or excluded from this moment of modernization. So uh, the artists, the class of artists and intellectuals really wanted to include and educate the masses at this moment after the revolution. Um, and there was a lot of focus on education of these masses. Uh, so I'm gonna read, um, this Tatiana Flores is actually uh, um, one of the main historians of Mexican art uh, in, in, in this, of this period. And I have a reading by her in the folder if you're interested in, um, but she summarizes this moment as, the Mexican Revolution propelled a cultural renaissance at home uh, and sparked the imagination of leftist intellectuals throughout Latin America, who dreamed of a future in which a commitment to social justice would replace centuries of oppression and inequality. The conflict, which began as a liberal opposition to, de re to the re-election of Porfirio Diaz, um, became an expression of discontent from Mexico, dis Mex Mexico's disenfranchised communities United in the South under Emilio Zapata and under Pancho Villa in the North, revolutionary demanded land reform, improved work conditions and betterments of social welfare from the state. Uh, and uh, these calls were answered by the constitution of 1917. The post-revolutionary moment became a time of spirit optimism during which different public actors work together to construct a new society. So it was a moment of really, uh, you know, a revolution in the arts as well, and a, an evolution, a revolution in the intellectual class of, uh, of Mexico. And one of the early movements then before muralism, uh, so uh, we usually start the, the, these courses with muralism, right? Which is kind of the most famous movement, but muralism was based on this uh, early, uh, early modern movement that was started by this young man, Manuel Maples Arce in 1922. Uh, he was a poet, and he launched a manifesto, which you can see here, uh, the no, actual, in this uh, magazine, he started the magazine and then he published a manifesto inside this magazine. And he wanted really to gain supporters from all Latin America. Um, so, and he wanted to change the art of, of Mexico uh, and, uh, you know, especially, because the art was based on, on the traditions of European traditions. So he started by um, making, writing a small introduction about his intent, and then he wrote 14 points uh, and included the name of 300 names, 300 uh, thinkers that were sub subversive. Uh, so he had uh, writers from the European avant-garde, erotic writers, everyone was kind of an inspiration, inspiration for him uh, to insert himself in this kind of international milieu. So he was like really trying to reach Europe uh, and saying, well, we're gonna start a new art in Mexico and I need the support. So he was actually also printing the, the manifesto and sending to several intellectuals in Europe and across Latin America to gather support. Um, and there's a, a lot of mention of technology and, and you know, modernization in this manifesto and trying to, to grapple with these new technologies. And from this manifesto, uh, Arce started a group 
that was called the 30 uh, So it was a group of artists who wanted to really uh, become uh, uh, the new, you know, the new avant-garde of Mexico. And uh, so I can show you their magazine was called the Irradiator. So you can see again, this, you know, allusion to the radio, to technology, um, to this type of more cosmopolitan uh, uh, and urban technologies that were coming in at this time. And this, uh, and you can see the, you know, the, the aesthetics, right? The visual narrative that they were trying to build was uh, bi-dimensional, very flat, and very easy to reproduce, right? You're using kind of like a print instead of like having fancy, you know, painting or anything like that. They were trying to really choose um, uh, material that were easy to reproduce. So to, uh, to follow this idea of the revolution. And this is a poem inside one of the magazines, uh, again, called the Irradiator. And you can see from, from looking at the, the organization, the visual organization, there is also like uh, an allusion. It is a poem, but it looks like more a scientific diagram, right? It looks more kind of a, uh, um, something that you would use to, to study, you know, uh, uh, phenomena, right? It, it's not something that you would think it's, it's a, a poem, right? It's not a, a unusual um, design for a poem. But he, he's using that, you know, as uh, uh, here, for example, these irradiating names out of DR, uh, he, uh, one of the historians says that DR can, be, can mean the doctor, can mean uh, Diego Rivera. Uh, so from DR, a lot of other things are irradiating to the community, to the masses, really to educate the masses. He was seeing this movement as a cure, right? A cure to uh, illiteracy. So the, one of the main worries about the, these movements were, was to really um, create a movement for literacy in Mexico and for their people. And this was the type of art they were challenging. Um, so the type of art that was taught at academies of fine arts in uh, throughout Latin America. So um, uh, it is a type of art that is inspired by European fine arts, right? It is a kind of like, alluding to Baroque, to uh, uh, neoclassical figures in, 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 in European art. So they wanted to push that again away, right? They wanted to create an art that was made by Mexican artists, not uh, imported, you know, uh, styles from, the, from Europe. And they, and this is type of the type of style they, are, they were trying to propose, right? There was a, you know, easy to be reproduced again, cheap to be reproduced, um, and, uh, and very um, easily, uh, you know, uh, simple shapes, right? Nothing very, not uh, lots of like shadows or, or fancy. Uh, so everything was very flat and bi-dimensional and to get the message across, right, for the people. So it's really uh, the printmaking tradition of Mexican art beginning in, in this moment becomes, you know, very, um, very important for, uh, for the history across Latin America. And another important um, um, accomplishment of these Maple, Maple Arce and other uh, young artists at this moment was to create schools uh, to educate other uh, painters and young painters. So uh, this is a school started by Fernando Leal. Uh, and you can see um, that they were using uh, this indigenous woman as a model for their, for their paintings. And this is really the start of Mexican muralism. This is these schools and this uh, specialized training that they were studying in the 20s is really how uh, Mexican muralism becomes so successful uh, uh, after that. 
So what is Mexican muralism? Uh, so Mexican muralism is a monumental and didactic artistic movement, right? Associated with social realism. So social realism is the style that was adopted by the artist and Mexican muralism is the movement itself. And so it's, uh, muralism is deeply associated with the Me Mexican revolution. And it was seeking what I was telling you to educate the masses and recount the history of the revolution. So it's, it was about, you know, it was about the revolution. It was about telling the history of revolution for the future, right? For the future generations. And it was also a movement that sought to assert and create this Mexican national identity, right? There was, uh, after such like 10 years of, of, of this uh, struggle really to unify the country, um, muralism was used then to give this uh, idea of national unity, to provide uh, a sense of national identity as well. Um, so, and this you can see here, uh, uh, one of the scenes painted by Diego Rivera, just for, and it's usually something that you see in several murals, uh, not only by Rivera, is the combination of the, uh, uh, these three figures, right? The peasant, the, the soldier, and the worker of, of industrialized worker with the people around, right? So there's always trying to unify the population through the, the figures that they depict. Any questions so far? So what happens? Why, why do you think um, muralism becomes so successful in, in Mexico? Uh, it was always supported by the government in this, in this early, uh, early phase. So the government decides to commission public murals to adorn their governmental buildings, right? Such as the Ministry of Education or the National Palace of Mexico. And so these sites, they're very iconic, right? To, to the Mexican society. Um, so I'm showing you here, the Zocali Square that you probably know about. And, and this is a, a where the National Palace is. Uh, the Ministry of Education is not very far from, from the Zocalo Square. And you can see in this image uh, taken by Tina Modori, who was a, an Italian photographer, how you, you have markers of modernization, markers of this cosmopolitan life, right? In, in the, the mid 20s here, uh, you have the tramways, the lights, and, and people were walking by. So there's this idea of a kind of living in this cosmopolitan um, uh, uh, scene, right? You see the soldiers, there are soldiers, there are peasants, there are workers, dandies, and all these people are kind of like getting together at this square that is so iconic for the for the uh, for the society. And this is also, you know, where these morals start to appear, right? To reach the this. Uh, these masses, but also because to occupy these spaces of identity, right? Then, um, could I ask serious. about the term muralism itself? Is this to do with painting on walls? I'm yes, not quite familiar with that term. Yes, yeah. exactly. So the. Uh, and Diego Rivera, he studied uh, and spent many years in Italy and Europe. So uh, he was learning the techniques from, from Italian, the Italian Renaissance, you know, he was a uh, Byzantine art he was interested in. So he spent a lot of time and actually when the revolution uh, started in, in 1910, he was, uh, he was not there in Mexico, he was in, in studying. Um, so it's, it's all about um, um, painting on the walls. And so it's, a, it's the perfect type of, 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 of uh, art to the masses because it cannot be sold, right? It cannot be moved. It's kind of attached to the beauty, to the architecture. 
Uh, so it's, it's, it's be really trying to break away from this idea of also the market, right? There's no relation to the market, but there's a relation to the government, right? Uh, so that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully show the, uh, some videos of the technique uh, of the painting on the wall, so you can see that as well. And how how is that done with the plaster, wet plaster? But thank you for the question. Um, so some of the characteristics of early modern, uh, early Mexican muralism is that in 1921, so one year after the the end of the revolution, you start to have commissions by the Secretary of Education who's Jose Vasconcelos, and he was a philosopher. Uh, so he was writing a lot about how to unify Mexican, uh, the Mexican society after the revolution. He was thinking a lot about that and he had uh, his own ideologies, right, to, to uh, come through. So the moral then becomes this effective way of communicating his ideas, right, and, uh, and other uh, philosophers and thinkers of that time in Mexico. But the goal, really, one of the main goals uh, was to improve literacy rates. Uh, it was a type of didactic art, right, to address the people directly, to tell his stories and his, the history of Mexico. And that's why it was in public buildings in this early moment. Uh, so there was a lot of optimism, as I mentioned, there was a creative community, community spirit and all these artists were, as Arce was doing with his manifesto, they were trying really to think hard of ways of uh, experimenting, creating these morals in an effective way to reach the, the masses. Um, but then that happens around 1921, and then around 24, Vasconcelos, who, uh, who was the, minute, the secretary of education, he leaves the department, and then you start to see only Rivera gets all the commissions. <laughs> So um, in the beginning, there was a lot of like diversity in terms of who was getting the commissions from the government. So you see other artists who are painting the murals for the government. But then when Vasconcelos leaves, uh, it's really about uh, Rivera. The Rivera becomes like an iconic figure of the government um, for the moment. And then, uh, you know, I'm not going to cover the entire history of Rivera's career, but uh, that's what happens in this moment. And then after that, around 34, 1934, um, things get, you know, the evolution, the kind of like, uh, uh, you know, optimism of the revolution starts to slow down and the government really becomes more centralized. And it actually, uh, it's when scholars of moralism and Mexican art say that moralism loses the um, the quality of experimentation and things become more you know standardized uh, and not don't have a lot of that you know early moment um, uh, optimism. And it is in this context of the you know the early early uh, moment of moralism that these three guys emerge, like um, in, in, in Spanish, they say los tres grandes, the big three, uh, who are Diego Rivera, uh, David, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco. And they were the three painters who received most of the official commissions in this beginning, this early moment uh, by the, go the Mexican government. Uh, but I want, I'm not going to go into, I won't have time to go into all of them, so I'm going to focus on Rivera, who's um, the most famous, but uh, uh, suffice to know, if you know a little bit more about this history, they have a very conflictuous relationship, they were always, uh, you know, uh, having arguments between themselves, uh, because they had a lot of responsibility, right, they were trying, they were creating a style, a national style for, for the country, so, uh, and they were not always, like, um, uh, you know, uh, agreeing with each other politically as well, uh, and, and I think Siqueiro was, Siqueiro was usually criticized Rivera a lot about, because Rivera was uh, went to the U.S. to paint murals in the U.S., as you probably know, in San Francisco, the, then in New York, 
And Hivera got a lot of criticism because uh, and uh, these other painters were think, well, you're not, a, you're now a capitalist, right? You're, you're a capitalist now, you're not a communist anymore because you're going to the US. And then in the US, Hivera was thought of, well, you're a communist, so we don't want you here. <laughs> So it was always in between this, this um, you know, uh, this uh, conflicts, Rivera especially, and we can talk a little bit about, uh, more about that. So uh, this was the style they were drawing from, not, not specifically this painting, but the style of social realism. Uh, and it's social realism is mainly art that focuses on everyday working class scenes and conditions. So there's social realism in several countries, several parts of, of uh, moments in history, but um, one example in the US is uh, the American Gothic by uh, Grant Wood. There's also Norman Hockwell, who was uh, famous in, in this style of social realism and trying to focus on, on this everyday uh, scene of, of working class um, um, people. Mexico, as I was saying, these artists were trying to create a new, uh, a specific type of social realism. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm just gonna drink a little bit of water. So in Mexico, what happens is that they focus on uh, um, uh, rural life, they focus on in the indigenous area and the peasant modes of dress, so that appears a lot, in, especially in Rivera's, and they want to always illustrate uh, leftist politics, right, in the service of, of building this new post-revolutionary state. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on the indigenous, there's a lot of emphasis on this um, the deep Mexico, right, and uh, these typical dresses, the ethnicities. So they, all these artists were looking at this uh, type of uh, um, pre-colonial art, really, and pre-colonial themes uh, to be inspired uh, to create this new style. Uh, and here you have um, this painting is called the Our Bread from 1928. And it's in the Secretary, uh, the Ministry of Education in Mexico City. I'm gonna talk. Let me just talk briefly about this painting, so we can have a sense of how uh, what is happening in this painting, right? So we have first in the central area here we have this dark-skinned worker who's clearly because of the the red star a communist worker, and he's presiding over this meal, right? He's breaking bed, he's sharing some fruit, uh, and who's at uh, at the table with him? Uh, you have representatives who are young and old. You know, you have light and lighter and darker skinned. Uh, working, popular, and middle classes. So there's kind of like this harmony, right? Or having a unity and everybody's at the table sharing these ideals of the post uh, revolution. Uh, but it was, what is also interesting is, um, you know, what is in the background, right? There's a lot of, uh, um, of there's the soldier, as I mentioned to you, the, the farmer, and this woman is a, a typical Tejuana, uh, um, in descendant of the Zapotec indigenous uh, peoples in, from, from Mexico. So that's how we know that because of the, the typical uh, dress that uh, she's using. And she's bringing all this, uh, you know, um, this diversity of fruits then to the table and offering that and kind of supporting, right, that union that is happening here on the bottom. Uh, so she's kind of a structure, right? She's structuring with the worker the whole painting itself, right? It's kind of a central line here that is very clearly uh, um, 
um, marking that center and importance in in the, the in the um, in the composition. And in the background here, you see uh, uh, industrial background, right? So she's not in that past, the the pre-colonial past. She's really in the future, right? In the present and future uh, of industrialization. Uh, so it's really about creating that unity, right? Creating that unity between the masses and all the different generations and, and types of, of social classes. So it could be amazing, right? That everything works like that and creating this symbolic unit, uh, unity is, uh, is solve everything, right? But that's, uh, you know, that's the narrative that Rivera and, and the muralists were trying to, to put forth. Um, does anyone want to, to talk a little bit about what they see here? Any other? Well, the person who doesn't seem to fit is that redhead on the left-hand side. <laughs> this guy? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, it's curious, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's just because it's like, yeah, it doesn't seem to fit because it's like kind of like smaller, right? In terms of compared to the others as well. But I think there's a, a idea of lighter skin, right? Or, of communion between the lighter skin, the types of skin and races as well that you're, he's trying to put Is that forth. the idea of also integrating a few Europeans? Is that the idea of the red, the red hair and this light skin? Yes, totally. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think at this moment, especially, yes, Mark and Barbara. Um, I was thinking that the uh, the uh, woman with the basket on her head reminds me a lot of the uh, the Tarascus fountain in Morelia. Is that a, a common theme of the women carrying a basket of of food? Uh, to yeah. The community. <clears throat> Yeah, I think so. I think it's really uh, some of these figures were also inspired by, uh, especially I don't know if it's uh, yes in the courtyard of, of the fiestas in the Ministry of Education. Um, uh, it seems that Rivera was going back to looking at some imagery from pre-colonial uh, indigenous people. So he was inspired by uh, sculptures by you know, very early imagery from indigenous cultures in, in Mexico. Um, and you see that in, in several. So I think he replicates, right? This kind of like iconic images that are not, he's not creating them out of scratch. He's really using that from uh, other sources from, from Mexican culture earlier on pre-colonial culture as well. Is that- One of the one of, the, one of the things that I found fa find fascinating is that the diversity of the people sitting at the table include young children. And how often do we see young children in, the, in a formal painting like this? It's just fascinating to me. It's true. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think a lot of scholars, uh, as we know with children, it's like not, not everybody focuses on studying imagery of children, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think out of my head, I think it's just, uh, especially because um, Hiveda was trying to really think about the, the past, the present and the future. And he was trying to reach the whole, all the, the younger generations, right? And the main goal was didacticism, right? And kind of education. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, and it's really a central seat, right? That he's taking here is like, as if the, you know, the woman, the man and the, ch the child were kind of connected, right? So it's kind of like maybe, you know, um, sharing this this history, right? Be through the woman, the man, and the child. So that's a good, great point. Thank you. For, and it's not. I think I, it appear. Uh, children often appear in 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 Hiveda's, uh, morals uh, in this um, in the Ministry of Education. And so, thank Does you. Does the, the text above it have significance? I'm sorry. 
text above the picture, how the, the group have significance? Yes, uh, I don't know what is like the entire thing it's cut, uh, but I, I can look at and see what it's like the entire phrase is. Uh, I can only see para, lo, para todos, for everyone, uh, los desnudos, so the, those who are naked, and so los hombres. So I think it's, it's talking about this unity. For everybody. Yeah, for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, I, I can look at the whole, it's just that I don't have the entire, but yeah, para, lo, para todos los desnudos, los hom, so maybe lo, los hombres, for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for this, these questions. So uh, anyone else would like to say? So let me just show you the, the whole building here uh, where this mural is. Uh, so this is the, the uh, Secretaria de Educación Pública, so the Ministry of Education. And it's close by the Zocalo Square in Mexico City. And it, as you can see, is a really monumental project. Um, I heard like uh, that is like 17,000 square meters of wall space that was painted by uh, Rivera. And that was from 1923 to 1928. Uh, so a long time working on this project uh, with, I don't know how many workers and apprentices, but probably many, many apprentices and, and, and collaborators. Um, so this was uh, the first commission by, uh, by Vasconcelos to Rivera. So, uh, so it was a huge, huge <laughs> achievement for Rivera, of course, and having that responsibility to communicate that the history of, of Mexico to the, to the generations to come. Uh, so it's a neo-colonial uh, architecture uh, I think it was uh, before becoming the Ministry of Education, it was a convent. Uh, and then that was built in 1639. Uh, and then there was like uh, renovations and after the revolution to become the Ministry of Public Education. And that was in actually, yeah, go ahead, Diane. Oh, I just I've been trying to look up the quote across the banner. M uh -huh. Many paintings have similar banners. I don't know if you can tell that from the photo, but I did find one uh, reference to this. Everybody says, um, it's from the 1930s. And the banner says, I think it broke a little bit, but could you share with us on the chat and then I can read it for. Maybe, let me see, can, if you share the link you found in the, on the chat, I can read to everyone what it says. Um, someone sent me a message and I can't get past it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to apply just to that one person. Uh, I'm having trouble here. Uh, if I can get it, I'll put it in, okay. If I can get to the place where I just responding to to the general chat, or um, just say it again, but lean into the microphone. We can hear you now, but your you were a voice was lost for a while. Yeah. Oh, it says um, this is from a part a series a sub series called Fruits of the Revolution, and it says um, our bread is and then quote bread for the naked and all the fruits of labor. Uh, yes, yeah, so similar to, to what I was uh, trying to decipher. <laughs> yeah, it, so it's just a, it's a script and it's hard to read because it um, doesn't stand out really well from the, uh, the background. Uh, thank you, Diane. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this, uh, each, each scene really, let me put this like here. Each scene is so full of, you know, symbolisms and, you know, meanings that are hidden, really. 
sometimes because Rivera was very specific about uh, like, you know, objects and colors. And so it's really, it's really about, you know, you can teach a whole class just about these morals. Um, so it was, as I mentioned to, to you, this was a neo-colonial uh, neo architecture uh, and then, you know, adapted and renovated from being a convent in the, uh, in the six, uh, 1600s. Um, so actually we have 235 scenes and panels. Uh, so it was a, a really a tour de force that Rivera was creating for, for, this, um, for this building. And let me move here. And he, uh, so he had two courtyards that he worked on. So the courtyard of fiestas, the parties and celebrations of Mexican culture and the courtyard of labor. So um, he uh, dubbed these areas uh, uh, and kind of like all the panels that he created in these areas were about labor or fiestas and celebrations. Um, and so let me see. So each of the courtyards ha has three floors, right? So in each of the floors, he was trying to convey a different type of narrative about labor, about uh, the celebrations of Mexican culture. And so here in the court of labor, you have um, in, um, narratives about textiles, uh, the tejuelas, the sugar making. Then you have the narratives and scenes about mining, uh, the peasants and pottery makers. So really about the, all the activities, uh, economic activities that were important and prevalent in Mexico. Uh, uh, so even before the revolution, right? And he was going back and looking at this, this different economic activities to depict them. Um, and it seems that the, he was creating this, this um, he was organizing these scenes based also on the regions of Mexico. So if uh, you had like steel foundries and farmers in the south or, or actually in the north of Mexico, and then you had the mining and the farming in the western region of Mexico. Yes, are you still, Diana, do you still have a question? Because you have the raise hand. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just wanted to make sure. And then the courtyard of fiestas, uh, then Rivera was going back, as I mentioned to you, he was going back to the, um, to the celebrations, the national celebrations of Mexican culture, way, way back also to the history of pre-colonial history and indigenous uh, uh, rituals and celebrations. So that was, uh, he was having inspiration um for that yes mark and barbara do you have a, a raised hand mark or barbara okay so and this is one of the examples of a painting, a scene, then a mural in the courtyard of labor. Um, as you can see, there's a deep, you know, um, thinking about uh, Christ, the, uh, the <laughs> crucifixion of Christ here, and an appeal, like, in, and then an inspiration by the Italian Renaissance in this painting. And that appears in several actual scenes here in the court of labor, because um, kind of like Rivera was interested in, in comparing the struggles of laborers uh, to the, the struggle of Christ, right? Uh, and kind of like glorifying these, uh, these farmers and workers who were uh, struggling in, with ex exploitation uh, in pre-revolution time, right? So he was looking at this, these figures and kind of thinking of, of their redemption and their glorification. Um, 
And this is also Christian iconography appears uh, very much in Rivera's work in the early morals that he created because, as I mentioned to you, he was studying the Italian Renaissance. He spent a lot of time in Europe. So he draws inspiration. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Barbara. Uh, so he draws inspiration from figures and from paintings um, uh, uh, that he saw in Europe, across Europe, especially here in the courtyard of labor. And then this is one of the scenes from the courtyard of fiestas. So you have here a representation, um, this kind of main representation is of the fiesta, the uh, Dia de los Muertos. So you have the, the skulls, right, playing the guitar, and you have, again, the farmer, the peasant, and the, uh, and the soldier. Um, so again, the revolutionary heroes and trying to create this, this unity of representation here. Um, and at this, the courtier of Fiestas, again, as I mentioned, he was drawing inspiration from several um, pre-colonial art. So he was going to, you know, uh, to the uh, to the indigenous cities and looking at the uh, the murals there as well. And here's an image of the same uh, um, building, the Ministry of Education. Just so you see how the the mural is is completely, you know, uh, uh, becoming part of the architecture, right? And how uh, Rivera was organizing the the figures related really to. Um, to be part of the, the door frames and to create this unity with, with the architecture. And in a, in a way, that's why the murals become so monumental, right? Because the architecture was also monumental at this, uh, for these commissions. So what we can um, uh, really summarize for this early moment is that storytelling storytelling, monumentality are important characteristics of, of early moralism in, in Mexico, right? So the, the narratives to, to teach, right? To uh, educate the, the masses are, uh, are then central to the style that uh, Rivera and others were, were, um, were producing. This is a, a mural in the National Palace of, of Mexico at the Zocalo Square. And this is again a monumental stairway uh, in which you see a vision of historical progress. So each of these arcways are a, a type of a different scene and a, a different moment in Mexican history. So the, the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz and the independence and revolution are central here. Uh, and, uh, and you can see also the US invasion here. Um, and uh, at the bottom here, you see the moment of the Spanish conquest uh, and invasion. And in the central also figure of the Mexican eagle, it's part of like representing the, the, the Mexican flag. Uh, but it's a kind of like this, this narrative is very overwhelming, right? If you're walking up or down the stairs, uh, it's kind of like meant to be so dynamic and that is like overwhelming you with history. It's hard to grasp, right? But I also think that is, um, you know, it tells the way that it, uh, history is also messy, right? History is always uh, uh, it's a bit subjective, right? And contested depending on who's, ta who's telling the history and whose version of history is. So I think it's, uh, it tells, you know, that um, uh, things that are not uh, in history are not linear, right? Or uh, always trying to, to reach a progression, but there's always a cycle uh, and things overlap. So I really, uh, this more, I think it's really uh, indicating that. One other thing that uh, many of uh, Rivero, Rivera's morals try to convey is, um, again, the idea of uh, uh, connection between past, present, and future, 
But what future is this, right, exactly for the Mexican society? And one of the most contested ideas of, of Rivera is his appeal to industrialization, right? So usually uh, he's depicting industrialization in a, in a positive light. So he deeply believed that the revolution had to lead to the industrialization uh, and modernization of, of Mexico. And that can be shown here uh, in this. This is the, when you go down from the, I'm sorry, let me go back here. When you go down the stairs to the south area of this, this mural, this main mural on the stairway, you, you get to this other mural that is kind of like the, the future, right, of, of Mexican society. And you see the machinery here, you know, the workers and, and kind of like all this area here uh, is kind of like a metaphor for modernization and industrialization. Um, and, you know, it's always like, you can see people are kind of constrained, right? And kind of like struggling as well. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like a depiction of that future that, um, you know, uh, Rivera is proposing for, for the Mex Mexican post-revolutionary society. What, what, is, what is the uh, story behind the slightly pornographic sprawling woman and the- Which one? Oh my gosh. <laughs> middle left there. This figure? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know specifically about that figure. I can look it up and see. Yeah, that, you know, if you start looking at, uh, I'm not a specialist on all the morals, so, and I actually, but I mean, I mean that uh, if you start looking at all the different figures, there's always an interpretation specific about what Iveda is trying to convey. Usually it's, it's you know, a type of like, um, uh, how do you say, he's probably not alluding to woman, but alluding to capitalism maybe, or something that a woman would refer, you, you'd be used as a metaphor for, you know, uh, um, but I, I can look, look it up specifically. Would you guys want to have a break and I can show you a few videos? So it's hard really to see the morals from the slides. I have a few videos that I have for you to, to have a sense of, uh, of the monumentality of these places. Or we can have a, a quick break. What do you prefer? Well, yeah, let's take just a five minute break then. Okay. I'll get the videos uh, ready when you, in five minutes. Okay. Would you like, you want to have sandwiches for lunch? <laughs>
So, uh, Tatiana, I, I had a question about that last mural. Was that, that was Karl Marx up in the top there, wasn't it? Yes. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show, show you again. It, it's interesting that he got all of this work in the U.S. since he was such a proponent of Marxism. Of course, I guess the whole Red Scare in the U.S. was a little later than that, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I have a video about one of the murals uh, that got destroyed in, in the U.S. Uh, I was first commissioned by Rockefeller, uh, and then <laughs> because it had uh, Stalin on, on it, uh, then they, they said, no, we're going to destroy it, and then you cannot stop, you have to uh, stop painting it. Um, I can share it with you. I'm sorry, let me, is this, it's a beautiful, uh, actually one of the, uh, a beautiful panel that he created uh, uh, in the 30s. And then he wanted, he was going to paint it in the Rockefeller uh, uh, Center then, no. <laughs> so it was a, a whole commotion that happened uh, because of that, because a lot of people wrote to Rockefeller saying you should uh, uh, let him finish, let him finish the panel, but then uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't possible. <laughs> um, I have a, a a message here. I'm so happy to see so many of us. Oh, that's great, Bonita. That's wonderful. We should you should have you know, talk a little bit about that experience uh, in Mexico City as well. We were, we, in the beginning of the class, we were introducing ourselves and talking a, a bit of the interests uh, in this class. So that would be great to, to hear. Yeah, I was um, one of them who thought that the class started at 10.30. I'm sorry, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm about that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so let me just share very quickly the one video that I have here. You can always, I can always share with you, um, but I, I think it's nice when you're hearing all this information and then uh, have a look at the actual. Whoops, what happened? Sorry. Is the, the, the Palacio Nacional.
And that that scene. <laughs> You can see Frida Kahlo, it's here. We're not seeing the video. We're we supposed to be seeing it. Yeah, you're not seeing it? No. no we're still no. on the painting, the history of Mexico. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh no. I was <laughs> I thought I was sharing. Let me see. Sorry about that. Yeah share again i think it was showing another window another tab let me see thank you for letting me know can you see it now like the the video yes yes, yes. okay sorry about that We don't hear the sound though. You can't hear the sound? No. It's actually just music. So I don't know why it's not playing. Maybe it's because it's on my headphones. I'm can you hear now? No. no. It's just also just a background music actually. There's no one saying anything. It's just just so you see the the monumentality of the, the scenes. And you have that scene that I was mentioning to you. And he's Fida Kahlo. Okay. It's just so if you don't have the sound, it's really not fun because it's like kind of a, a, a <laughs> nice song. <laughs> Let me just move it. Ah, why? Why I don't? I cannot play the sound. I don't understand. Because what I had um, there's a, a a short video in which one of the apprentices uh, talks about his experience of um, helping Rivera in in San Francisco to paint the mural and he talks about the technique and the uh, and how uh, you have the wet uh, the plaster wet and how long you have to wait until you paint over it so maybe I'll, I'll just share these links with you on the chat since I cannot uh, play the sound and then I'll for next class I'll figure out why why I can't uh, have the sound for you I think there is a button in Zoom that can has to do with playing the sound from videos. Oh, really? I think so. So I'm going to take a long time to find it. So I'll uh, share computer sound. That was not that hard. <laughs> OK. I was in contact with Roy Rivera. So I think it's worth watching and then we can have final questions. Numerous people posed can you for hear? Rivera. Okay. Yes. There are a large number of portraits of assistants and people from Detroit. He probably it was very close to the same technique somebody like Michelangelo used in the Sistine Chapel. His assistants essentially were apprentices, learned their trade by doing. Now, this is a view of myself, rather a young man, 46 years ago, in the cold cellar of the Detroit Institute, getting the final 
coat of plaster in preparation. And that was my job. The Mexican chemist Sanchez, whom we call High, constantly checked all the ingredients that we used in the mural so that they would function. Fresco painting requires just mineral pigment without any binder. You can't buy ready-mixed fresco paint. It has to be prepared by hand when you want to use it. I don't think any of Rivera's pigments are ever going to change on this wall. They're going to be just the way he left them. One of the things that High Sanchez used to do was measure the humidity to predict how many working hours there would be for each painting session. So that Rivera knew when he picked up the paintbrush that he had X number of hours to complete what he had in mind before the plaster was transformed to stone. Rivera had the craftsmanship to do this in a simple, unruffled, uh, very hard working, concentrated, extremely concentrated, hard work. Rivera had to know ahead of time where he was going or he couldn't have done it. The palette uh, Rivera favored was a ordinary baking pie plate or soup dish that you'd find in a cheap cafeteria, a white porcelain enamel dish. Rivera, of course, realizing that uh, his underpainting being done black and white, if he painted that in the daytime, it would be evening before he could apply color. Not wishing to work with tungsten light, he would start work usually about midnight. And he would spend the rest of the hours of the morning till daylight working in black and white underpainting. As daylight appeared, he would switch to color, and then the colors which he painted were the true colors as to be finally seen in the courtyard. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I, I, um, it talks a little bit about the techniques. I think it's super interesting, right, in terms of like having all, imagine like 235 panels at the, the um, uh, Ministry of Education, right, that you have to think about all and coordinate all that. So it's really, uh, and I have, I can also uh, share these two videos that talk more about the fresco technique um, and that you can listen on your own. It's, they are very short, like three minutes, but I, I wanted to see if you have My name any questions um, for me. Barry, should we go over um, no, or because we, like some people got in at 10.30, what do you, do you prefer? Well, I think we, we can go a few minutes over, but we should probably wrap it up pretty much. Yeah. Up. Okay, let me just um, go back to my slides and we can wrap it up, so. Can you see the slides now? No, right? I have to stop sharing and start again. No. Okay. You can see the slides, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So just to finish then, um, what we have is Mexican muralism was adopting social realism, right, as, as the main style, specifically in Mexico, going back to the depiction of indigenous, the proletarian, and the quotidian, right, the day-to-day -day life of, of the masses. Uh, but also mainly trying to illustrate life as politics and the life that, uh, you know, uh, should become in the future after the, the revolution. Um, it was also didactic, so um, following and trying to convey a narrative, storytelling of sorts, uh, illustrating historical events, and again, making past, future, uh, and present of post-revolution. And again, very linked to the architectural qualities of the buildings uh, and, and kind of like cannot be detached from the buildings. Actually, in San Francisco, now you can see at the SF, uh, SF MoMA uh, a mural 
by Diego Rivera, who was extracted from the college, from, from a college in, in California. And they recreated, kind of like moved the, the mural to SF MoMA and its own view until I think uh, early 2023. So if you're interested in visiting, it's, um, I mean, let me pause here and show you the information for that. Um, that mural. This is the mural that is on view at the, at the museum right now. It's called the, uh, the Pan American Unity Mural. Uh, it's really amazing effort that they did to, to move around the, that mural and, and bring it to the, to, the, to the museum. So I think it's worthwhile visiting it. And the San Francisco Art Institute also has a mural by Rivera. Um, that was commissioned in the, in, uh, I think in the 30s, uh, uh, 1926 actually. So this is, I can only, there's only this image of the top of the mural, but it's a, it's a smaller mural uh, in, in a gallery now, uh, but it's really beautiful because it has this huge worker, main figure, uh, uh, who's the, uh, this worker. And then this is the figure of Rivera painting uh, can you see my, what I'm like the, the figure of the mural here? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is Rivera looking at the figure, uh, the, this uh, main figure. Uh, and so it's, and it's, it's all about also the architecture because it's like, uh, kind of like creating a, a window to, to the outside of that building as if he were create, looking at San Francisco. Uh, and recreating San Francisco a landscape uh, in that uh, in their mural, so it's really worthwhile uh, having a visit at it. Um, but I want to hear your your opinions about the the content of today. Uh, I couldn't get to the anthropophagic movement. That was my idea. I wanted to bring to the Brazilian art movement as well. I can start next week with that uh, and show you just a few paintings um, of the early muralists, uh, early movement in Brazil as well, um, because uh, I think you you enjoy knowing uh, that that other uh, artistic movement. Let me show you who's the. I don't know if you have seen this. Um, this painting here, if you know, anyone anyone knows this painting, no? Yeah, I think you would enjoy the story. It's about the, it, they were, this uh, intellectuals were borrowing from the idea of cannibalism uh, uh, to create their movement, their early modern movement. And it's really seminal to the constructivist art we're gonna talk about next week. So I'll probably start uh, just introducing a little bit next class, uh, next lecture, I'll talk about this. These uh, painter, Tarsila do Amaral, uh, who was one of the main uh, artists of that, of that movement. But I would love to hear a little bit about your thoughts uh, and, and you know, interpretations of the images the, that we discussed and questions you have. I would really enjoyed chatting a little bit. I'd like to say one thing. Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the sort of the, the background and context. You know, we've been to Mexico a number of times, uh, and especially in Guadalajara and in mm -hmm. some in, in Morelia, we've seen uh, some really monumental murals, uh, like in the Hospicio Cabanas and, and uh, you know, Orozco's uh, murals there, <clears throat> and in a lot of the public buildings uh, seems to, to be portraying sort of a struggle for justice and things. And having the, you know, sort of the background of, of the muralist movement in Mexico, you know, gives it, gives it a context that I, I had lacked, I yeah, guess. Good. So, so I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, I always like you know, struggle a little bit because I know it's a, when it, it get can get a little bit heavy in terms of like history. So I'll try to do a balance of that for <laughs> next lectures. <laughs> but um, but I appreciate your feedback. I think mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. 
Well, uh, let me ask, these murals were so complex. How did, he must have plotted them out some way, sketches, et cetera. What do we know about how he put together this, this intricate series of scenes he had? Yeah, he had lots of sketches. I think he would really work uh, with, um, you know, uh, smaller ones. And then he would get like, uh, I guess, like, I don't know. Uh, I always like, struggle with the measure, <laughs> like uh, around the meter uh, of, of, of the, the drawing of the panel, like from one meter. And then he would do the sections that he wanted to, uh, to paint in, in that order and decide where he was going to start. And in this other link that I sent you, the MoMA um, techniques, uh, um, the link to, to MoMA in New York, you can look at how he was uh, dividing each scene, each little scene, he would do like three or two different parts of the drawing in, in which he would, well, I'll start painting this face here and then tomorrow I'm gonna paint the arm. So it's really a lot of work, a lot, a lot of work. And, and I think he would have these sketches and then uh, divide each each scene in several parts to to come up with because the plaster it's wet but it's like it dries right so he had to work uh, with that time of the plaster so he had to have a lot of like expertise on, on knowing how long he can um, in the area the right area of the plaster he can work on for a couple hours you know uh, uh, so I would really recommend looking at this, uh, watching this little video um, today so you, you have that in your mind. It's really amazing how he would do, ask the apprentices to, to split, you know, the, the narrative in different little parts so he can, he could, he can, he could paint and decide the colors. Um, but I was like, it's, a, it really isn't major you know something that i don't think artists do now you know uh, they don't really use the technique again uh, this technique anymore right i think it's a uh i don't know if it's lost but most artists who paint are using graffiti you know other types of of of, of um, um uh, uh of course still use the fresco but i mean many uh muralists are using other other um, more contemporary techniques, right? So they're easier to to accomplish to finish because, as you can see, you had a chem he had a chemist, right? To to combine the colors, uh, so wonder it was yeah. Any other questions or? Well, I would you like? Uh, go ahead, Barry. Sorry. Oh, I, was saying, I think we'll we will wrap it up there. That was a great start, uh, Tatiana. Okay. Could I could I ask you to reply to this poll so I can know your interests? Um, it's just a four questions that I have, so I'll know you know if I can uh, have more activities, discussions, and things that are more interesting to you. I don't want to. You guys here two hours with just me talking and talking. So I really want to know more about what your thoughts are for this course. Mm -hmm. Is that okay if I start the poll and see if you have? Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay, so this is, I hope it's showing up. So we just click on the... Yes, I think you have just to click on the multiple choice um, responses and then send it to me. Is that easy to do? I don't know if it, how it shows in your screen. I see someone replied, so. Yeah, well, your last one is a little bit daunting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. And this is all, I don't know who's answering what. So you don't, I don't oh, so get the. Okay, okay. So all anonymous. So <laughs> I won't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I would be happy to do 
well, I, I wanted to continue on. It definitely has been really wonderful. Oh, thank you. I only, oh, there's a fourth one. <laughs> yeah, there are only four. I just want to know if we can, if it would be nice for you to, you know, uh, share your projects with us and we could do that the last lecture, you know, or, uh, or we can split the group and someone talk, some, uh, some of you talk in the, on June 30th, you know, and if you don't make art, you can bring something that it's meaningful to you, you know, a sculpture, a painting, or even just an image to discuss. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're, thank you for being here and attending, listening for two hours. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Yeah, see you next week. On time. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, I think no, it was my fault. No. <laughs> what what will the time be? 10 a.m. Thank you. 10 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great weekend. You yes. too. Stay safe. Enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy the nice weather, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so, Tatiana, I, I was trying to click on the poll, but, but I, because I'm a co-host, I actually... Oh, you can't. I, You're I, seeing the results? Yeah. Oh, nice. I think it's fun. I think it's a way of knowing, Yeah. yeah. you know, if we can be, I can be more interactive because sometimes people want to participate more. Some other times the groups are not, you know, willing, don't want to participate. So I just want to know, so I'm not, you know... You know, just speaking, well, I think, speaking. <laughs> I think what you saw today was typical. Um, uh, I think with Zoom, they're a little less interactive than they have been in person. Uh, yeah. But still, there are some people who, who, who do participate, and that, that way you get the feedback. So that was good. Yeah, no. I'll do more images. I think I, it was a lot of like, theory today so I'll, I'll, I'll think I'll do a little bit more images but you also had a some moments for the introduction so I think that right was... right yeah that was nice and I think everybody appreciates getting their little moment to say something so that was yeah I think that's important yeah okay all right so okay, see you well, next thank week you very much that was really <laughs> really excellent okay okay thank you so much Barry see you next week okay bye Bye-bye. <laughs>